co-author here somewhere. It's probably your co-author? Yes. Yeah, great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sergio Daga, board member of the Bolivian Society of Economists. I would like to welcome you to our second day of the Bolivian Conference on Development Economics 2020. Yesterday, we started this conference with an outstanding keynote address by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, followed by the presentation of the SDGs Municipal Atlas of Bolivia. We had 15 contributed sessions with 45 papers presented as well as two special sessions where the World Bank and CAF Development Bank of Latin America presented their policy-related reports. Focus on Latin America, similarly, there were two informative sessions, one of the economic journal based on the region and the other of graduate studies in economics, finance, and development. Today, we start with this long-awaited keynote address by Professor Johanna Rigner from Stockholm University. And I said long waited because Professor Regne highly accepted Tebow's invitation last year in November to deliver this lecture. However, due to the social unrest brought by the fraud in the presidential elections in Bolivia, our conference had to be canceled. Before I leave the screen to our chair of this lecture, Professor Pablo Zelaya, I would like to invite you to continue with us afterwards. We will have an excellent panel session on COVID-19 and long-term strategies as well as the keynote address by Professor James Robinson from the University of Chicago at 1.30 p.m. Bolivian time. Similarly, we'll have 15 contributors sessions. I now pass the post to Professor Pablo Zelaya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Um, it is a big pleasure to uh, be the chair for the first keynote lecture of today, which as Sergio said, is going to be spectacular. We have Johanna Rickne, Professor of Economics at the Swedish Institute of Social Research in, in Stockholm. Uh, she's also an affiliate professor of economics at Nottingham. Uh, she's a research fellow at the ESA Institute of Labor Economics in Bonn. She's a member of the Center of Economic Political Research. She is highly prolific. She's an expert in, uh, she's a leading researcher in gender economics, in labor economics, in political economics, and in China's economic and social development. So, her work has been published in top uh, journals in, in both economics and political science. Um, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to have uh, Johanna here. As Sergio said, Johanna was going to be the keynote speaker for the conference last year, which we had to cancel, but she made all the efforts to, to, to come uh, to, to Bolivia. Uh, so it's absolutely great for us that she accepted again to to give this keynote lecture online. We hope to have the chance to have her also live uh, when we organize the, the conference I again in the future. Uh, just as, a, as a, just the administrative details of, uh, of, uh, of this talk, Johanna, uh, I'll, you, you will have, we have one hour. Um, you can take 40, 45 minutes to give your lecture. I will be collecting the questions uh, which will which can come in either English or Spanish. Uh, Johanna uh, will understand questions in Spanish. I don't have to translate them. Um, and I will only interrupt you if, you, if there is a very important clarifying questions. 
Otherwise, I will just uh, collect the sessions uh, and, and have them by the end of the talk. So, Johanna, welcome very, welcome. We're very happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. Um, this is a real honor to be able to talk at this conference. And let me share my screen with the slides. So, as Pablo said, my work is mostly within gender economics. And uh, recently I've been focusing a lot on understanding gender inequality in the labor market. And this paper that I chose to present today is recent work together with Ulle Folke, who's also on this call, on uh, sexual harassment and gender inequality in the labor market. So the backdrop of this work is the large economic inequality that exists between women and men. And this inequality is rooted in two basic facts. Women and men work in different occupations and they work in different workplaces. So men tend to work in higher paid occupations and workplaces than the occupations and workplaces of women. So Economists are focusing uh, on why we have this sorting of men and women across the labor market. And a recent strand of work has suggested that work conditions are important for understanding this phenomena. And in particular, the argument has been that women and men prefer different uh, work conditions. Women, because of greater responsibility in the household, might prefer uh, jobs that are more flexible and they might prefer shorter commuting distances, uh, for example. So women trade off getting these work, good work conditions that they like more than men for lower wages. So the sorting we see across occupations and workplaces come out of these different preferences for which work conditions to have. Okay, this is, I think, a little bit this most recent view, uh, up-to-date view on the, this role of work conditions. So, oh, sorry. Okay, so in this uh, particular paper, we look at work conditions from another perspective, uh, namely one of discrimination. So maybe men and women have the same preferences. For example, both men and women prefer not to be sexually harassed at work. But uh, when men and women choose occupations or firms where they are gender minorities, they might be more exposed to this negative work condition without getting any pay to compensate them. So this sorting that we see could at least partially be explained by non-compensated discrimination in work conditions. And this is the argument that we have in this paper. So to summarize our contributions, this is the, we argue at least, most comprehensive empirical study of sexual harassment to date uh, in any academic discipline. We use nationally representative survey data which is linked to employer-employee data for Sweden. And in addition, we develop our own survey experiment. We have two main results here. Uh, one is that women face a high risk of harassment in male-dominated occupations and workplaces and vice versa for men. So gender minorities, either men and women, uh, face a higher risk of sexual harassment. Then uh, with the survey experiment, we established that people, that this is really a disamenity. So people dislike the risk of sexual harassment and it does carry a large disutility, but this disutility is not economically compensated with higher wages or other better work conditions. So we conclude that um, this bad work condition is essentially a tax on gender minorities in occupations and workplaces. So it's a disincentive for both men and women to take those kinds of jobs. And a third contribution from this work is that we uh, think that we, <laughs> we uncover a reason for why employers have low incentives to both prevent uh, sexual harassment and pay these uh, compensating differentials. And that is that, that while these gender minorities have a large disutility from the risk of harassment, they coexist in the same firm with people of the opposite sex who don't have an aversion against their victimization. 
So the gender majorities, for example, me, maybe as a woman in a woman-dominated firm, I don't have a large disutility from men being harassed and vice versa. And this bystander tolerance that we uncover in the survey experiment, we think is important to understand why employers don't have a large incentive to prevent uh, the problem or offer compensating differentials. So the roadmap of the talk is like this. And I'm gonna explain our theoretical argument about sexual harassment as gender discrimination in workplace amenities. And this is a non-mathematical non framework. Then um, I'm going to describe the incidence across occupations and workplaces, depending on sex ratios. After that, explain the survey experiment where we measure the disutility of sexual harassment. And then finally, talk about um, the existence or not of uh, compensating pay differentials for this disamenity. So first to establish what we're talking about here, we use a psychological definition of sexual harassment, which defines it as unwanted sex-related behavior at work. And this phenomena is often subdivided into four types of behaviors. One called unwanted sexual attention consists of physical unwanted sexual behaviors, ranging from groping all the way to rape attempts or rape. The second called sexual hostility consists of non-physical but unwanted sexual behaviors, for example, crude conversation, staring, showing dirty pictures. The third type is called sexual uh, sexist hostility. So this is not sexual behaviors, but rather um, hostile uh, behaviors based on the sex of the person. These are usually negative attitudes about men or women in general, or about their capabilities to perform a certain occupation. So if I think that men are not capable biologically of being kindergarten teachers and take care of children, that's an example of sexist hostility. So the, our data that we use to look at incidents measures these first three types. And the fourth, fourth type, we don't have a measure of, and it's also the by far most unusual type uh, in surveys. It's called sexual coercion and it links uh, physical sexual behaviors to some kind of threat of punishment or promise of reward. For example, you're not going to get your promotion unless blah, blah, blah. Now, um, our theoretical framework for understanding this phenomena in the labor market deals uh, both with where it happens, uh, the fact that, it's, that it is a disamenity, it's a bad work condition, and the fact that it's not economically compensated. So first we predict um, that the risk of sexual harassment grows with a share of opposite sex people in the occupation or workplace. And this prediction comes from two main theories. One is on gender norms. These theories predict that just in general, women are harassed more than men because the norm is that men take the initiative in these sexual behaviors in general. But uh, for both men and women, theory on gender norms predict that uh, they use this bad behavior as a tool to retaliate against people of the opposite sex who break gender norms. So uh, illustrating with the example from this paper on the um, economics of identity by Arkelof and Cranton, they illustrate, they talk about how a woman carpenter enters a firm with male carpenters, they lose some male identity when she enters and then they use sexual harassment to retaliate against her, make her feel uncomfortable and maybe stop breaking gender norms by being a carpenter. So the theory would suggest that both men and women engage in that type of negative behavior. So the second uh, theory here is called the contact hypothesis. Here, the idea is that if men mostly harass women and vice versa, and we have a constant probability to commit harassment among both men and women um, across different uh, socioeconomic traits. So men or women with different income, age, education are equally likely to commit sexual harassment against a person from the opposite sex. That means that there's a mechanical relationship between the sex composition um, of one's work environment and the risk. Uh, so 
either men or women who spend a larger day of their larger part of their work day with people from the opposite sex are at a great, greater risk from harassment. Uh, this is called the contact hypothesis. So um, it is, we think, unproblematic to think of sexual harassment as a workplace disamenity. This uh, concept in labor economics is defined as a negative work condition that produces some risk of injury. And there are literally hundreds of studies that show negative mental and physical impacts from sexual harassment on the victims. So um, we predict then basically that people dislike jobs in workplaces where they risk to become victims of this disamenity. And in addition, we predict uh, Combining this, like the, the risk, uh, the negative impacts of the risk with the previous prediction for sex composition. If we think of the labor market as very sex segregated, there's going to be many workplaces that are sex segregated. So we have a high risk gender minority coexisting in the workplace with a low risk gender majority. And among these gender majorities, whom we refer to as bystanders, they have a low risk and should hence have a low disutility from, uh, from sexual harassment in their workplace because that harassment happens to people of the opposite sex. The final prediction regards compensating pay for this disamenity of sexual harassment. And here we predict that this is not going to exist. Um, here I just cite three reasons for that. Uh, the first it comes from the previous slide and it's what I just said that these gender majorities in firms don't have a disutility because they are not at risk and they are not going to demand. I mean if I were and if I'm an employer and I can hire people from the gender majority who don't demand any compensation for this bad work condition, uh, why would I hire a person from the gender minority who require more pay? So here it just becomes illogical for employers to offer any compensation because there are majority gender people who don't demand it to work in that firm. The second reason for our prediction of no compensating pay is simply because the legal frameworks of most countries prohibit uh, that kind of behavior from employers. You're not allowed legally to offer pay in exchange for sexual harassment. And the third reason is simply that a market for this work condition is unlikely to develop because of information frictions. So employers don't know necessarily if harassment is happening in their firm and workers don't know which firms have harassment when they pick jobs. So in contrast to wages that there might be more information on, this is largely unknown. So lack of information um, makes it hard for a market to develop. And even if information exists, employers have huge incentives not to provide legitimacy to accusers. And we know from a lot of work in other fields that have asked people who have made accusations, who have whistleblown on sexual harassment in their firm, that by the vast majority of the firms respond to that whistleblowing by retaliating against the accuser or trivializing the problem rather than saying, oh, you were the victim of sexual harassment. Here's some money and some nice compensation for that. Okay, so in sum, we uh, predict here that the risk of sex sexual harassment in the labor market is going to be systematically skewed toward gender minorities of both genders in occupations and workplaces being at risk is going to be associated with a disutility for the individual and it's not going to be economically compensated. So all else equal, the risk of sexual harassment is going to impose a tax on men and women who uh, make choices uh, that make them become gender minorities in the labor market. So we think that conceptually we should think, you know, when we think of labor, labor market behavior of people, and how that relates to work conditions. Some might be compensated, but just like we have discrimination in wages, uh, we can also have discrimination in work conditions in the labor market. So now um, I'm gonna uh, talk about these three sections that test this, uh, these predictions that we have. The first one then is to simply look across the Swedish labor market. What is the risk of harassment for men and women, depending on the sex ratio of their occupations or workplaces? 
And here we use uh, something called the Swedish Work Environment Survey. It's collected by the Swedish government to have a biannual complete picture of the work conditions in Sweden. And this um, random sample of employed people, and it's stratified by sex, age, occupation, industry, and social class. And we use five of these cross sections for a total number of 50,000 respondents. This survey is fully anonymous and the firm is not involved. Like Statistics Sweden sends a survey directly to the employer, so the, to, the, to the employee. So the employer never finds out that people are surveyed. So they can't intimidate workers to give a rosy view of the firm. Second, um, this survey has over a hundred questions of um, physical and non-physical work conditions. So the salience, uh, it's not a, like, it doesn't arrive to a person who's like, oh, this is a survey on sexual harassment. It's rather a survey of a hundred different things. So we think this is good in terms of lowering the potential uh, social desirability bias um, that would come from thinking that this was particularly about sexual harassment. It also gives us many other measures on uh, interpersonal workplace problems that I'm going to use later. So um, one of the big strengths of this survey is that we have the personal ID code of every respondent. So we can link these people to um, administrative data for the full Swedish labor market, every worker in the country. And this means that we can compute the uh, sex ratio First, in the three-digit occupation, so if I'm a nurse and I answered the survey in 2007, we can use the population data to compute the proportion of men among all nurses in that year. So that's uh, maybe trivial, but here the second uh, feature is even better because we can find the physical workplace of each person by the unique combination of the organization ID code and plant ID code for their largest source of income. So if I work in a particular Walmart store, um, we can find the other people in that same survey year that have their biggest income from Walmart, the organization, and the physical address of the store, which is um, the plant ID. So this means that we can find all people in the same physical workplace and compute the share of men. This uh, is the questions that we use to create the dummy variable for sexual harassment in the last 12 months and only within the organization. So these questions consider only colleagues and managers here. And we set this dummy variable to one for people who answer affirmatively to either of these two questions. The first one captures unwanted sexual attention and sexual hostility. And it says sexual harassment is defined as unwanted advances or offensive remarks around things that would be commonly associated with sex in the last 12 months. Did any supervisor or colleague sexually harass you at work? The second question, which measures sexist hostility, reads like this. Have you been exposed to behaviors other than the ones above, which degraded you or violated your integrity and were based on your gender? This could include condescending and ridiculing statements about women or men in general or in your occupation. It could also include that someone because your gender ignored you or what you were saying. So in the, if you're interested in the appendix, we split these up, look at them separately, look at different thresholds, etc. But what I show now is just one dummy for saying yes to either one. So we take these 50,000 people in the five cross sections, and I first show only women, half of the sample. And these graphs are then for the share of men in the occupation of the respondent and the share of men in the workplace. And these are bid averages with approximately 500 people in each point. So we can see that for women, the risk of sexual harassment, uh, the incidence, grows uh, linearly with the share of men in the occupation and also with the share of men in the workplace. And in the most male-dominated occupations, uh, about 20% of the women self-reported sexual harassment in the last 12 months. And the worst occupations for women to be in on the Swedish labor market is engineering, vehicle operators, to be architects, and actually also academia ranks pretty high along also with police officers. So 
this shows that women gender minorities suffer more sexual harassment than women over here who are in have very low shares of men. <clears throat> so what does it look like for men? This is the pattern for the male respondents. So first we can note that just overall, uh, the rate of self-reported sexual harassment is much lower for men than for women. But importantly, these men over here who are gender minorities, they are in occupations with uh, the smallest share of men. They have at least the most sex segregated occupations, an equally high rate of self-reported sexual harassment in the last 12 months at the women in the most male dominated ones. So 20% of those men report sexual harassment in the last 12 months. And here we find male nurses, male kindergarten teachers, and also uh, care, like elderly care employees. Um, we put, uh, you, you could maybe think that occupation share sex ratio is correlated with workplace sex ratio. So in the paper, we show that putting these into regressions together, uh, both for both men and women, both sex ratios have uh, independent correlations with exposure to sexual harassment, but we don't find um, inter any interaction effects. For men, uh, we find an interaction between being a male gender minority and being of an ethnic minority, which is also, we find interesting. So for women, if you're an ethnic minority, well, if you're an immigrant-based ethnic minority in Sweden, you don't have a greater, uh, that's not correlated in the Swedish case with sexual harassment, but for men, uh, it is. And especially these men um, who are crowded into these low-income occupations have a higher risk. So um, one cr criticism against this description could be um, that uh, gender minorities have some kind of victim mentality. So they give exaggerated negative uh, views when asked about their work environment. In general, they are just negative. Um, and here in this figure, I show sex ratios just like before. But on the y-axis, we have another type of self-reported interpersonal mistreat mistreatment, which is bullying. And here, we don't see any correlations between bullying, neither for men or women. If you're a gender minority, you don't report more bullying from your colleagues in the last 12 months. So if our sexual harassment results were only due to gender minorities being more negative about all types, like they just think that they're being exposed to bad behavior from their colleagues, then we should arguably see it across all types of interpersonal mistreatment, which we definitely do not. So we think that this is pretty interesting as evidence that the first set of results reflects some actual exposure. And um, now I want to talk about, okay, so now we know that gender minorities for both genders are more exposed. Do they suffer this utility? Like, is this really a negative work condition? So we measure this with a survey experiment on hypothetical job choice. And this is, a, I would say, standard method by now to try to measure how people evaluate different types of work conditions. And the, how the survey experiment is set up is that you make, you give respondents choices between fictional jobs displayed as a table with two columns where each job has some traits, which I'm showing on the next slide. And these traits include both the wage and work conditions. And these are randomized. Uh, each person, see, so if I answer the survey, I get three choices. And each choice is a table where I pick between two jobs and the traits are randomized in there. So this, um, depending on how people choose, we can look at how people value higher or lower wage versus better or worse work conditions. And this relationship in between wage choices and work condition choices is called uh, the willingness to pay for amenities. Uh, so we could think here that, you know, asking someone in a survey what job they would choose is a bad, like it's, it's not a great proxy for what choice people would, of job people would actually make in the labor market. But uh, there are some recent interesting papers that compare the estimated valuation that people place on work conditions in these surveys compared to natural field experiments 
in job advertisements for actual jobs where you change the work conditions randomly and look at how job seekers change their seek intensity. And they argue that the estimates are very similar in the survey to those actual jobs. And so we embed this, uh, our particular experiment in something called the Swedish Citizen Panel. And we did this last year. We have 4,000 respondents and we pre-registered the survey experiment at EGAP. <clears throat> this is um, what the job choice looks like. The vignette reads, imagine that you're looking for a job and you have two offers. You will see short descriptions of these offers and choose which one you would be most likely to accept. The jobs differ in four attributes, but other are otherwise identical. The table below shows your first set of jobs. So here I show the first three traits. And this is just, in this part, we just replicate what other people have done in these survey experiments on job choice. The respondent sees two jobs, like I said. Underneath here, there's a checkbox. So they check which one they would be most likely to accept. We have three traits, the wage level, skill development, and schedule flexibility. And these, each time you see these, these rows change randomly placement, and the values in these cells are also randomized. And for the wage, uh, we have four values, 5% less than you make now, no, uh, the same wage that you make now, 5% more than you make now, and 10% more than you make now. For skill development on the job, we have three uh, traits or three values, low, average, or high. And for flexibility to schedule your work hours, we have um, no flexibility, flexible start and end time within one hour, and fully flexible schedule. So what do we add here? We add a fourth row, which is information about the work environment on this fictional, uh, these two fictional jobs. And we have four values, uh, no particular information, positive work environments saying that people in the work unit seem content with the work environment. Third, another type of uh, workplace problem. And this was to throw people off in order for them not to see this as specifically being about sexual harassment. So this says that some employees in the work unit have had conflicts with the manager. And then the fourth uh, is uh, sexual harassment. And to capture sexual harassment, we did not mention these words. We didn't say the firm has sexual harassment. That would risk to confound uh, the, the estimates with people's own conception of what sexual harassment is. So instead of that, we went back to the first part of our analysis. Remember that we have had three types of sexual harassment in the Swedish work environment survey. We had sexist hostility, sexual hostility, and unwanted sexual attention. These are the three most common types. So we went to survey data on these types and selected like two other survey data that we collected for another paper on these types. And we, so from a long list of behaviors under each of these types, we selected the most common one. For sexist hostility, the most common um, subtype then of this type is that people, ex people express that people of the other sex are not suitable for a job. Um, and for sexual hostility, it's uh, uncomfortable discussions about sex. And for unwanted sexual attention, groping is the most common. So we inserted little vignettes about these three most common types, but in the estimation, we just pulled these three into one single dummy variable for having this, like seeing this as part of your fictional job. And in the appendix, we do show results uh, by like after splitting them up. So um, this gives a representative view of what sexual harassment is, which we think is important to give a realistic view. And um, and in addition, what we did here was that we were careful to show people a vignette with a victim and a perpetrator uh, that corresponds to the most common case that they would encounter in their own workplace. And this is what allows us to divide respondents into potential victims and bystanders. So before people even came to this question of the job choice, we asked them, um, 
is your workplace today mostly female? Is it gender mixed or is it mostly male? And for everyone who was in a mostly female workplace today, we show these vignettes like you can see with women perpetrators and men victims. And for people in mixed or mostly male workplaces, we showed male perpetrators and female victims. So this then means that for like the women who are in women dominated firms are going to be bystanders. They watch men be harassed and the men are going to be uh, like men are going to see this vignette and arguably see themselves as a likely victim because they see a vignette where a man is harassed. <clears throat> so what happens in these experiments uh, in the actual estimation is that you end up with a data set where you can see for each column uh, in each table, did the person pick this job or not? And that's the outcome variable. And you estimate a regression with that dummy outcome variable on dummy variables for the traits that were shown, like the values of the traits that were shown in that uh, specific job. Um, and this uh, regression has a complete, um, like it's a saturated regression with all, like one dummy for every single value of every single trait, but leaving out one value of each trait. So that means that we get estimates on the probability to choose a job when it has 5% higher wage, 5% lower wage, 10% higher wage compared to the same wage that you have now. And similarly for sexual harassment, we get estimates on um, how the probability to choose a job changes when you have sexual harassment compared to no information about the work environment. And we can then uh, compute the ratio of those uh, coefficients relative to each other. And that's what we plot in this graph. And this is what's called the willingness to pay. So if you, we can talk more about this method in the Q&A, but uh, I think the intuition is pretty clear if uh, we look at this uh, estimate on sexual harassment, so it's 0.10, like the willingness to pay is 0 0.10. And that means that people were equally reluctant to pick a job that had sexual harassment as they were to picking a job that offered 10% lower wage. So the disutility of taking a job in a firm with sexual harassment was equally large to the disutility of taking a job with a 10% lower wage. So this is substantial and similar to, for example, having no schedule flexibility. And the first result out of two results that we have from this uh, survey here, survey experiment, is that when we split the sample by sex, the, this utility from taking a job that has sexual harassment is the same size for men and women. So it's not the case here that women dislike sexual harassment and men do not. Neither men or women uh, like the risk of sexual harassment. The second result uh, concerns the difference between men and women who are either bystanders, part of the majority sex, that watch people of the minority being harassed, and those who are potential victims who themselves belong to a gender minority. And this uh, is shown over here on this side when we split the sample into these two groups, we see a very large disutility among the potential victims, people in the gender minority, but not so much among the gender majority. And this is actually true for both men and women. Women don't mind uh, taking a job in a firm where men has been harassed and vice versa for men. Mm. Quickly mentioning one important uh, sensitivity check, it here in this part of the table, we address a common criticism against hypothetical job choice experiments, and namely that they are too hypothetical. You make people pick between jobs uh, that vary in traits that people have no idea about. So we ask people before the experiment, actually after the experiment, if they are aware of any particular, like any explicit cases of sexual harassment in their own industry. So people who say that they are aware, they've heard people talk about sexual harassment, maybe they've been harassed themselves. These are people for whom the hypothetical job choice experiment is not very hypothetical. They know of firms where harassment happens, so presumably when they choose jobs, they, you know, they have some idea of how they would actually choose. So among these people, and these are half of, uh, no, two thirds of our sample are aware, there's a huge difference 
here we find among the potential victims a huge negative evaluation of sexual harassment. And again, nothing among the bystanders. So our, our result of victims and bystanders, or indeed the main result, is not coming out of these people who've never heard of sexual harassment case, but it is coming out of these people for whom the survey experiment is less hypothetical. Okay, so what we have established here, arguably, is that both men and women have a large disutility, self-reported, from taking a job in a firm where sexual harassment has happened. And this is particularly true for these gender minorities that are the most exposed on the labor market. And the final empirical section considers two tests of whether or not people are economically compensated for this disutility that they face. So the first test that we do looks at wages. And here we're back in the first data set that I talked about in the incidence analysis. This is a Swedish work environment survey linked to the complete labor market employer employee data. So we ask here um, if the high risk sex receives pay compensation relative to the low risk sex within the firm. So, well, in the paper, we run this compensating pay analysis in many, many different ways within firm, at the individual level, occupation, person level, etc. But this specific graph is at the workplace level. So each workplace is one observation. And we compute for each workplace on the x axis the predicted gender gap in the probability of sexual harassment. And we can do that because we have survey data for self-reported harassment um, by occupation, uh, occupational sex ratio and workplace sex ratio. So we use those same results that I showed in the beginning to compute a predicted gender gap in any workplace in the economy. So that ranges positive values, a larger risk for women than men in the firm, and negative values, a larger risk for men than women in that firm. And on the y-axis, we have um, computed values for the gender wage gap also at the firm level. So here we use the fact that for everyone in the economy, we can observe their wages. So we compute in each firm the female male wage gap, but conditional on age and occupation. So this is holding constant people's age and occupation and comparing only the wage gap between people that have the same age and the same occupation in the firm. So um, if there were <laughs> compensating differentials, we should see that a higher relative risk of sexual harassment in the firm for women should be correlated with a higher relative wage for women. But what we see is the opposite. So the greater women's relative risk compared to men, the lower women's relative wage compared to men across firms in the economy. And on this side, the only cases where women, you know, the gender wage gap is positive, so women make more money than men, the only case in the economy where that happens is when men have higher risk of harassment for women than women. So if men were being compensated, we should see that men earn systematically more when they are at greater risk, but men actually earn systematically less too when they are at a higher risk. So this we think is, I mean, this is one piece of evidence that there's really no compensating pay at the workplace level for the risk of sexual harassment. And our second, the second test I wanna show you looks at individual level data. And this is also from the uh, Swedish work, uh, work Environment Survey. This survey asks about many things, uh, apart from sexual harassment, bullying, etc. It asks about people's job satisfaction. It asks about whether you considered leaving your job in the last year. And we can compute because we know, uh, like we can look at each survey respondent over time in the employer employee data, we can compute the dummy variable for whether or not people remain in the same firm where they answered the survey three years later. So what I show in these three, or actually for men and women separately, so in these six graphs, is to, is to regress a dummy variable here for having low job satisfaction on a dummy variable for that individual self-reporting sexual harassment in the Swedish work environment survey. 
the idea about compensating differentials here is that if I'm a person who suffers from this bad disamenity, but I'm compensated either with wages or with some other nice work uh, environment uh, traits, then I should not have lower job satisfaction than a person who's not sexual harassed. So if they were compensating pay, we shouldn't see a difference. Like they should be compensating this disamenity. So there shouldn't be a gap in satisfaction, quit intentions or quits between the harassed and non-harassed. But what we see is instead that harassed people have, as you can see here, 10 percentage points, uh, higher rates of low job satisfaction, 20 percentage points, higher probability of considered leaving the job, and about four percentage point higher probability to actually having left the job. And this, if um, the different specifications here control for m various other types of bad aspects of the work environment and which these estimates are not sensitive to. Importantly, these include occupation fixed effects, various demographic controls, controlling for the workplace share of men, which can control for other types of bad culture, arguably, and controlling even for these other interpersonal mistreatment, bullying, etc. So the last graph is just the breaking up the quit patterns from firms. Instead of looking at a dummy for three years later, we show a year by year estimation to show um, that people who say that they were sexually harassed in the survey, like going year by year, this counts the number of year after the survey and compares the quit probability in percentage points. Women who self-report sexual harassment are you know, you can see that this is not a feature of just taking year three, but it's a persistent pattern for women at least, a little bit less for men. So to conclude, oh yes, to conclude. And in this paper, we study the phenomena of sexual harassment as uh, gender discrimination in workplace amenities. So first we look at incidents in the Swedish labor market and find that one gender usually has a high risk from sexual harassment and the other one has a low risk, but both men and women who are minorities in their occupation or workplaces have a higher risk of this disamenity. I'll find that there is a, at least not full economic compensation for this disamenity. This means that uh, sexual harassment should be considered, we think, effectively being a tax on women or men who choose occupations and workplaces in ways that break sex segregation on the labor market. So for women, this means that there's a trade-off in picking higher paid and more prestigious jobs because they also face sexual harassment there. And for men, uh, this extra tax just adds to the disincentive of choosing lower paid, less prestigious uh, female-dominated jobs. And if I should say something about policy based on our results, I want to point to our results in the survey experiment for bystanders. So we find that while if I'm like people who are at a risk of sexual harassment in the firm are very reluctant to take a job there, but people don't care so much if that firm has a large risk for the opposite sex. So this would be similar maybe to racism or some other type of discrimination in work environments. Majority, so if we want to change employers' incentives to invest money to prevent this type of problem, we should focus arguably on changing the preferences across jobs of these um, bystanders to help build coalitions to really evaluate the negative aspects, uh, the negative consequences that this work condition has on the victims. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johanna. This has been really a fascinating talk. It's certainly uh, one of the most comprehensive studies on, on this dimension of um, uh, gender inequalities that I have seen. It's, you're also exploiting fabulous data and, 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 and you have complemented all the study with a very well motivating and realistic and and well-planned experiments so absolutely uh, impressive evidence uh, about this and first evidence about this so and, and, and tremendously timely also in the context of Bolivia where we are where we are starting to discuss this uh, you know this type of gender inequalities or the consequences of gender inequalities more seriously 
So I have, um, there are some, um, should we have some, should we receive some, we haven't received yet some questions in the Q and A. I have some some questions. Uh, if I if I can ask, yes, of course. Well, we great. Um, in this, uh, well, one of the uh, really nice uh, pieces of evidence that you show is at the beginning in the descriptive statistics where you show uh, the, the shares of female victimization according to occupation and and sex in the workplace, and you mentioned. Uh, differences across occupations. You said for, you mentioned engineering, the police, or you know sectors where where, there, where, where one can imagine more easily uh, more biased sex uh, ratios uh, at work. So I was thinking whether in, in whether in that occupation disaggregation you have politics like w women or men in mm. politics or, or or administrative working you know in the public sector or something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. We have not, as far as I know, looked at that specifically, but that's, that would definitely be interesting to do and maybe even do some sub-analysis or focus in some other work on more like specific sectors. Yeah. We, we have a question now from Andres Gutierrez. He says, um, can you tell us if there is economic evidence between discrimination and growth and economic development, discrimination and economic development. What's the, what's the evidence? Yeah, as far as I know, I haven't seen any paper, you know, a macroeconomic paper that discusses this issue. But the way we think about it in the, at the macro level, what that type of modeling could look like is similar to recent work that looks at wage discrimination and how it introduces a tax on being the gender minority, uh, like I said, in an occupation or workplace. That's also where others have argued that wage discrimination is the greatest. So if we think of people having some kind of talent for different occupations, then, and there might be an extreme value selection. So the people who select into being a gender minority, you start out with the people that have the greatest talent. So women who go into the military, for example, might be from military families. They have a lot of knowledge. They might have special learned skills that, that make them really good at being in the military. So you have people selecting in, in that fashion. Okay, suppose that's true, then we're losing a lot of macroeconomic efficiency from having this misallocation of people because of the discriminatory work environment. So arguably there are lots of women and men who really have an interest and a personal fit with these occupations, for example, male nurses or women police, but they're not choosing them because of the bad work environment. So by comparing the distribution of talent to the distribution of people, you could tease out like others have done for wage discrimination, the cost to different countries, depending on the size of this, like I mean, the prevalence of sexual harassment. That's how we think about it in, in, at the macroeconomic level, but we haven't seen any evidence to that extent. Okay, very good. We have another question. This is from, um, from uh, Luke uh, Andersen, who is a uh, chair of the conference. So I will allow her to formulate the question herself. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you very Hello. much. Thanks. I just wanted to hear which is the occupation that is worst in Sweden in terms of the incidence of sexual harassment, according yes. to your data. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in our incidence graphs, uh, we use the three digit level. And when we look at the, the worst occupations, we have to limit, I mean, we have 10,000 people per year in these cross sections, but we don't want to trust occupational data for occupations with too few respondents. So if we limit occupations to having at least 50 
respondents in them, then the worst occupations for women uh, are engineering, police, architects, and motor operation operators and vehicle drivers. And academia ranks among the top 10 worst occupations. And the worst occupations for men at the three digit level and requiring 50 people, uh, 50 respondents in the occupation are uh, nurses, kindergarten teachers, and elderly care workers. Thank you. We have another question from Lore Quiroga. Uh, she's asking uh, the following. Have you seen any relation between the WTP com compensation and business or firms gender quota? Um, she clarifies, for those firms that are legally required to comply with a gender quota, have voluntary incentives to incur in working compensation? Yes, so um, I guess, I mean, in Sweden, we have gender quotas for political parties, which I actually studied in my previous work. Yeah. So there you have gender quotas that buy, like gender quotas for the actual employee level. But other types of gender quotas in Sweden only exist, well, for company boards. So maybe she means company, like company board quotas, companies yeah. with board quotas. Right, um, I, can, I can also ask uh, Lore Quiroga to, I have allowed her to, I can allow her to formulate the, the question. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes, I was um, asking regarding, because you mentioned about different, um, different types of uh, work that are the worst for women let's say architectural engineering and whatsoever right so there i know that there's a gender quota in some businesses or firms boards but at the same time i think that when you speak about minorities you're referring also to well that, that can occur in genderly and racially minorities that certain firms uh, on an employee level below the borders below the boards um do not do do need, yes they need um, gender quota. So, is there any incentive for those firms and businesses to in, incur and voluntary compensating wages for for those gender quota that are, you know, meaningfully um, minorities? Yeah. So, in the Swedish um, in the Swedish case, we don't have uh, the company board quotas in a strict sense. However, we do have recommend recommendations uh, enacted by the government that essentially work to push firms in a similar way, which there's papers to show that firms did consider that an actual quota. So, I mean, I think you're, you're getting at this important, something that we think is very important in terms of the market push. Like, if there's competition for female labor or for the gender minority, then firms have a greater incentive to attract those women. So those should be the most likely cases to observe compensating differentials where firms, like either it's a very tight labor market, so you can't, like to find competent people, you have to find women, or there's a affirmative action, so you are forced to hire women. So I think quotas is a, yeah, that's a really good idea to try to look, like we can separate the sample in that way. So right now, the robustness test that we do for compensating differentials in the most likely sample of tight labor markets is we look at the wage uh, flexibility in the firm, which we spoke to union representatives in terms of, you know, where would we see compensating differentials? So they were saying, okay, first of all, it should be competition. So we looked at high, highly competitive subsectors of the labor market. And then second, it should be where firms can actually change wages. So low union intensity. So when unions are strong, firms cannot change an individual person's wages that much to compensate for bad work conditions. You have to have the same wage for different people in the same occupation. So we restrict the sample to firms where unions have lower influence on wages and where competition in the labor market is high. And even there, we don't see any evidence of compensating differentials. So I think adding gender quotas there would be really good because it's like, yeah, the intuition is the same. Like if we would observe it somewhere, or maybe if this problem was possible to solve by, by competition for labor, then you know, that, sh that should be a way of looking at those potential policy uh, avenues. Thank you for the... Thank you. 
Thanks. Thank you. We have space for one last question um, from Fernanda Vanderlei. Um, Fernanda, I can I can allow you to um, you are allowed to use your mic to. Okay. Uh, Johanna, thank you very much for the excellent uh, explanation and paper and research. It is wonderful to see how this uh, methodology is ab advancing uh, to understand this phenomenon of discrimination and harassment in a specific in workplace, in the labor market. So uh, could, uh, my question is, could you estimate in what extent male and female in the research were aware that the phenomenon of discrimination was related to sex ratio in the workplace or occupation? And how, how is the, the, the public debate on that? So how your paper, your research is impacting and a policy Make, making. Mm, so, so far, I'm not sure if we've had a lot of impact. This working paper just came out a very few number of weeks ago. Mm, but hopefully, I mean, our goal is to try to, to do that. And we did present this work at a number of, especially unions in Sweden. Mm, so in terms of awareness, and I hope that I understand this correctly, I think one of the most important questions to address in trying to understand this phenomena is to, like the phenomena of sexual harassment is try to um, find out how much people know and when. So for example, in school, when people are choosing, like people choose to become a nurse or police officers very early in their life. So when they make that choice, how much do they really know about the true work environment? where people, like when people are in university, they spend time with people like engineering, women in engineering school, they spend time with engineering men, students that are the same age. But then they go out and work in an engineering firm that has first of all, older men and maybe a different attitude in that industry compared to what they experience in, as a student. So to understand how people select in and then you know are exposed to this but cannot select out because once you choose an occupation and firm there's switching costs so you invested in a specific firm and a specific occupation so you can't just retrain to become a nurse when you're a police officer so to to understand how much this phenomena really hurts individuals i think we and how to fix it i mean we need to figure out as yeah you know, what pe information people have if we can give them better information and what these switching costs are and how people might be locked in to these bad work environments, which can then have other consequences for their health, et cetera. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. We have, thank you. We have run out, unfortunately, of time and we have a very tight schedule. So, uh, Johanna, thank you very much also to Ole Folke as your co-author. It's absolutely fabulous to have uh, had this very stimulating lecture from you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, and I hopefully can see you all in the future hopefully sometime we'll in see, person. Yeah, we'd be very happy to see you as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.